Hi, everybody. Welcome to August and Precog time with Ilana Harris Babu, um, who we're really lucky to be talking with today um, about her previous video works and some new work that will be shown this fall um, at a group show at the Queen's Museum, which is really exciting. Um, and we've known Alana for a couple of years, but haven't really checked in with you about the work in a long time. So um, this is super exciting. And we wanted just to start out as we always do and ask you what's been going on with you during quarantine and how you're feeling these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess I gave a little rundown of the ramp, the ramp part of the adventures. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm feeling, I feel like, yeah, I've entered a whole new kind of phase of moving into my apartment in New York this week after having been, I'd been living up in Williamstown, Massachusetts for three years. Um, and I had been planning a move back to New York this summer for a long time, but then obviously everything about it got like really complicated. Um, but yeah, I think I, for a long time, I felt a weird sort of like guilt thing about like being somewhere where I had so much personal space and stuff like that and could go on hikes when like everyone else I cared about was like more kind of crammed in and feeling like I should maybe come back and just be more helpful. But um, now that I am back, it feels really, it feels really good and right. You know? Yeah. And you grew up in New York. Yeah. 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 You're and I haven't, yeah. And I haven't really lived, I went to grad school in New York, but then besides that, like since I turned 18 or what have you, I hadn't lived in New York full time at all. I just always been back and forth. So now hopefully I'm just staying put for a, a year. I mean, it's not like I could travel anywhere if I wanted to, but I had been honestly getting really, I don't know. I had been feeling like moving, like flying or something. It's like, I feel like your body's confused because it's not used to moving that far in that amount of time anyway. And it had been made me, like I had been really, really sick in 2020. And then right before Corona happened, I like got better. I had finally gotten better and I was like, okay, here we go. Like the year's starting. Like I'm going to do this. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's so like, I, nope. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> So yeah, so like I was sick and then the world was sick, but um, yeah, I feel, I feel excited for about what's to come. I don't have a studio right now, but hopefully if, if folks are able to move around still in September, I'll have one at Pioneer Works. Great. Mm -hmm. And is that like close enough for you that you can get there walking and stuff? Uh, probably not walking. Yeah, yeah I think. Car. I was like, I forget that people can drive, you know. <laughs> I forget that too. I never in my life thought I would learn how to drive because like my, my parents can't drive, my siblings don't drive, like no one in my life drove growing up. But I had to learn for that to move to the Berkshires, like I just had to learn. So, yeah. and I was really excited before when I thought I was moving back about like finally freeing myself from the like murderous burden machine that felt like my car was to me like just um but then now obviously it's super helpful so I'm not getting get rid of it <laughs> yeah. it's interesting um and kind of like um almost unexpected to that the fact that you haven't been home for such a long time considering that so much of your artwork deals with your family and also like home building you know home building mm -hmm. and home furnishing uh-huh um, and I was wondering if you could talk about what it's like to collaborate with your mom and also how you started thinking about some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say like my mom is like a total ham. So she's definitely more comfortable in front of the camera than I am. And I think when I started making videos, I kind of had been doing like painting maybe like when we had met when I had been like a student at Yale mm -hmm. and then I had gotten really and like tired of them because I felt like there was really only one moment in the life of a painting that I was excited about and it was like before it dried like when it was still sort of like wet or in a state of becoming or something like that and so I um I started shooting video just because I was like I want to like capture that moment or something because it seems like I should just give that moment to people like in a direct conduit and then 
Um, so then I feel like my approach to, I've never felt comfortable, say, like, directing people or something or, like, forming a narrative or um, creating a scene. Like, and so, and generally just feel very uncomfortable, like, having people, like, collaborating. <laughs> I just, like, not very good at collaborating. So I, when thinking about it, first starting off with just being myself in front of the camera uh, with, like, a remote or something hitting play. And then being like, okay, well, if I'm going to work with other people, like, who's the closest to being me that isn't me? And, you know, and that, and that kind of felt like my relatives and my mom in particular. Um, and so since I was in New York for the first time in a couple of years when I um, went to Columbia, she was finally able to, like, see, what, see my studio or see what was happening in my studio and, like, take the subway up there. And so... Um, I had been like reading stuff like you do in grad school and I had read that um, pieces of the erotic, the speech by Audre Lorde. And in it, she ha talks about her memories of uh, needing a bag of margarine when she, during, when she was young during World War II. Um, like I guess margarine used to come in these white packets with a yellow pellet on top. Uh, I think maybe cause like the butter lobby didn't want people to think it was real butter or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but she talks about leaving it out to soften and then pinching the palette of yellow coloring and kneading it. And um, my mom was reading it in my studio and she got really excited because she had a lot of memories of doing that when she was a little girl. Um, and so we started like get, getting to talking about that. And that was like the, the first sort of like recipe that we shot from that video together. In the cooking. Um... The erotic. Yeah. All right. Let's show a little clip of that just so we have a reference of what you're talking about. Um, let me just pull it up. Good. Welcome to the cooking show today. Thank you so much for joining me. Now there are many kinds of power, both those used and unused, acknowledged and otherwise. The erotic is a resource that lies within each one of us and comes from a very deep female and spiritual play. Rooted in the power that comes from our unexpressed and unrecognized feelings. The power that comes from sharing deeply with another person forms a bridge between the sharers. We'll be building, we'll be cooking, and we'll be having a great time. Ilana, how did you become interested in this uh, how-to format um, for your videos? Yeah, I think like when I started making video, I, um, yeah, because I didn't really come to it from a film background or perspective. When I realized that I wanted to make videos, I had, I had to start thinking about, okay, how am I going to edit them? And I first went to like, okay, what are the kinds of videos and moving images that I look at the most? Like, and how do I copy the kind of rhythm of those things. 
And so at first I was looking a lot at music videos since I'd been watching them on YouTube. And I had been making a lot of videos that kind of were set to music and cut in a, w in, like, in a manner that was similar to music videos. And I think like when I started doing that, maybe 2010 or something, like music videos, especially in hip hop, were still kind of in the space, like a Hype Williams kind of space where everything was really shiny. You know, it'd be like pile of gold, car, woman, pile of gold. Um, all sort of uh, treated with the same sort of like surface, um, focus on surface. And I remember when I was at school, I was reading um, uh, Krista Thompson you know her she's like a Jamaican art historian who had this essay called the sound of light and I think now it's a whole book mm -hmm. um that like was talking about like the idea of bling as this like the sound of light bouncing off of diamonds so this optic and physical like haptic optical and haptic and sonic experience sort of being flattened into one and that like act of flattening is sort of like generating its own sort of value like the thing a person like seeing themselves being seen. And so basically I was just really excited about the shininess of like the surface of like the materials I was using in the studio and stuff like that. But then I like, I guess just naturally started to get kind of like bored of that um, and started thinking about, okay, like what other kinds of video am I looking at that also um, use the lens and use lighting to kind of transform objects and materials and in particular transform kind of imbue those objects with value. And I had been looking at a lot of just like cooking shows on YouTube and like New York Times cooking, like I've been looking at Melissa Clark a lot. And like in those videos, right, you could like light a turd beautifully and it would seem delicious. <laughs> and, and you know, and the way they show you things, it's like they show you it um, just long enough for you to get the feeling of making the thing or make you feel like you're in real time with the host, but not enough to like fully be instructional and like perhaps like if you saw some of the shots were longer than they put them on the screen, like they wouldn't even seem delicious. Maybe they'd seem like grotesque or, or like banal. Um, and so I liked in editing kind of playing with coming right up against the edge of that, that sort of timing. And then so thinking about like cooking show timing now and then also sort of like comedic timing and like musical timing. Um, and that piece that you just played, like every sort of background song, like relates like specifically to the content of what's happening on the screen and I was like and it's like kind of remix of like samples that I found so like that opening is like the opening of um Melissa Clark on New York Times cooking like the kind of first few notes of her that would come up before she came on the screen and then I kind of asked like my friend told me make like a trap remix of it but like there are things where it's like someone's cooking and there's like a remix of soul food by goody mob or like in the part about margarine there's a song about butter that's remixed and so i like that some people would maybe get the references and others not but there could be like lots of different points of entry it's i feel like when you were talking about food um like or when you're talking about bling and lighting and the idea that like the shiny thing in the video is like its own um is a is kind of like a a a symbol or signifies um a reflection right that it would allow for someone to be seen like by virtue of its shininess mm -hmm. um i i feel like the relationship to like glistening olive oil or something like this like the kind of um, the way that bling as a kind of aesthetic might already exist in, like, um, might already exist in these really banal subcultures, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, living inside of music videos or, like, being in some way um, racialized or about class in particular ways right that like that desire already lives inside of the ethos and aesthetics of how-to videos and cooking videos mm -hmm. and just as you're talking about it it seemed like that the relationship to audrey lord right and the relationship to the uses of the erotic could be talking about that kind of ethos like mm -hmm. the way in which we might um, talk about glistening or something like this 
and also mm-hmm. make fun of glistening at the same time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about maybe desire and the erotic um, in your work, especially because um, I think so much of like the, the manifest content of experiencing your work is your sense of humor and the way in which you participate, but also make fun of a lot of these tropes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like I'll, everything I kind of make videos about are often phenomena that I feel sort of like implicated in too, like <laughs> never kind of looking at it from an entirely like external critique stance. Um, but I think what I was really excited to me about the Lord text was this like experience of the world that exists outside of utility or like classical notions of utility um, that could be wholly one's own. Um, and like to see labor or something through the lens of the erotic is to kind of take ownership of that in a way that kind of like no one else could take from you perhaps. And um, yeah, so when my mom read the margarine passage, like what was exciting to her about it was that the memory she had from when she was a little girl was that she, um, she lived with my grandma uh, in this like fancy mansion in Connecticut where my grandma was a maid. And so like she shared a room with her. And so it was like the kid's job every day to like need the margarine. And it was something that she really like looked forward to and found like really fun. And I was thinking about that, like that Audre Lorde maybe was taking this idea of margarine as like a lack of butter, for instance, or lack of access to resources. And how like she says that she wanted to see the erotic as that like kernel of yellow coloring within herself. Um, but then like, yeah, but then so like, like how for my mom, like maybe something we think about as lack of say like access to play or like free time for a child, like instead for my mom through the lens of play at which she was like engaging with these materials, that experience also became her own. And thinking about like these different spaces of creation and maybe like what you're talking about the olive oil, it's almost like how we sort of make ourselves through, through these like valued, objects and images that we surround ourselves with so thinking about like how is the artist this like idea of archetypal artist swinging around paints between white walls like similar to or different from I don't know like a music video vixen or similar to or different from a cooking show host or home improvement host and then similar to or different from like my grandma like cooking pig sweet in the kitchen like which types of creative labor are revered and which ones are mundane um and like what happens when I like sort of cross the wires between those uh, different ways of making and engaging with objects. I'm curious, you make all of the ceramics that you use in those videos. Do you want to talk about the making of objects in creation of the videos? Yeah, I think like first I was making the ceramics kind of like as props and sets in my videos. But also I think whenever I, I always, whenever I made a video, I was thinking about how it would be in the world, like with someone's body in a sort of ideal format when they saw it. So a screen or inside of an installation. And thinking like when I made Cooking with the Erotic, it's two channels because it was like for two monitors in this installation that almost was like made out of the set uh, that I shot the video in that kind of mimicked the kitchen or something like that. But I really liked play because it was like the most direct path from like my hand to object or something and like making this work that was so fixated on touch it seemed like a really kind of quick way to make that happen and I started thinking about like this idea of like dysfunctional ceramics or something so like what would a long like a three-foot spatula do to the way you thought about something pancakes or something like that but primarily I was just doing it because it's like fun to do and you know feels nice maybe why a lot of people like to use ceramics um, but yeah I, then I once I started doing it for the props they kind of maybe like took on a life of their own or something like that um Ilana I had a question about um so you also um you make a lot of connections between things that you wouldn't like usually think about together so in one is beauty products and the other is um like real estate so um can you talk a little bit about the, um this how did you like start thinking about these two things yeah i mean i think like that, that maybe it's like a confluence of things i was thinking about and then a set of like prompts or context or something like that 
So say like first that show at the Queens Museum, it's like all kind of artists making work around the idea of real estate and a lot of the artists all kind of being in or around New York. Maybe may, I might be the only one from New York, but thinking about that specifically. Um, and so I had at the same time been thinking about wellness culture because a lot of the things, ideas I explore kind of, it seems like a place where they like manifest almost on the body. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing this residency in Amagansett in the Hamptons and had been going to like the Goop store and all of these uh, places and being really interested in like that language. Um, and then like looking at these kind of makeup tutorials that they'll have like YouTube, like Vogue will release or something yeah. where it's like an endless <laughs> amount of products and stuff. But it's the natural look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the, like the language that they use, like clean and stuff like that. Um, or in the Hamptons, they have this wellness magazine called Purist, which is, it's called Purist, an adventure in wellness. And it's like an Amagansett specific wellness magazine. And everything's like clean, pure pics, X, Y, Z. And so I had been thinking a lot about real estate and other works and like kind of with this idea of the American dream, who's locked out of it and which mechanism. And so like looking at a lot of like federal housing authority, like guidelines for like redlining. Um, and home loans, uh, exclusionary practices uh, that were almost like mandated by the federal government on things. And like they use a lot of euphemisms and things like that too, like for the idea of clean, right? And like undesirable elements and keeping them out. So how that language in and of itself is like racialized. Um, and so that's when I started kind of just this idea of like my mom doing a beauty demo and then her doing one for a reading with the real estate developer kind of came into my mind at once. Um, because, I mean, I guess we'll see what, how everything goes now and how the conversation shifts now. But back then it was like, she's kind of like the prime, she has a house in uh, Crown Heights, Prospect Lefferts. And so kind of the prime target for this, what they call deed theft. So these kind of predatory practices where they'll look for like, someone like her, an older single woman, old homeowner, and try to like trick them into selling their home on like less than ideal terms. And so they'll like call and they leave notes that look handwritten or personal on the door and like constantly just trying to like reaching out to her in this way that seems like at first friendly, but clearly is like about business. And so that's why I started imagining like, what if like when a lot of these times they're doing a beauty demo for a night out or something like that. Like what if she's doing a beauty demo for her meeting with the real estate <laughs> developer? Um, do we show some of that video? Yeah, can, do we have, yeah. It's ready. And so this is still um, a work in progress, Ilana? Yeah, it's like mostly there, but I'm still fiddling and there's a physical installation part that isn't done. Cool. And this will open, you don't know yet, like sometime. I think hopefully early September. Now okay. it's become that web thing that I sent you. So that's like one first manifestation of this show. Like it actually was all just like, it was supposed to open April 1st. So it's like the whole show has just been sitting there like mostly installed, I guess, in the wow. museum um, since um, lockdown started. All right. I'm Sheila. Today I'll be showing you my beauty routine for meeting with a real estate developer. I start by first cleaning my mirror. Okay, so my next step is the primer. Now, primer is essential. It sort of lays down a, a coating that will adhere to your next step, which will be the foundation. Now, my primer is a clay-based primer, upward and outward. You always want to keep your lines, the, minimize your lines and 
the upward motion is uplifting and uh, that's my intention. Always important to read the label. Unicorn Realties Group, dear Sheila, I am a real estate investor and developer active in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. I've been operating in New York City since 1995, and up to the present day, my company has been among the most active buyers in these boroughs. Unicorn Properties purchase single and multifamily buildings for high-end renovation and resale or retail. We also buy land for new development. A sample of our projects can be viewed on Instagram and Facebook. We will carefully consider all properties asking price brought to our attention. If you are interested in selling your property or simply in discussing possible options, feel free to contact me now or at any time in the future for frank and informative conversations. Sincerely, Senior Director of Real Estate Acquisitions. He sounds sincere and what he states here is accurate as far as I'm, I've been seeing things happen around me. So why not meet with him? He's coming to look at my house. He's looking at me. He's making an assessment. And so I want to present my best. And uh, so this is why I use this particular primer. Uh, I actually use it for all my uh, interactions. Um, I have a question. When you're filming with your mom, how much is being improvised? Or, you know, do you have like a little bit of a script? Um. For this one, it's like basically all improvised. For earlier works, usually I take kind of like snippets from like texts that I'm reading and kind of recontextualize the language in front of different imagery so that like other meanings come up. Um, say like mixing up like uh, federal housing authority guidelines with like uh, real estate catalog. Uh, not real estate, um, like high-end furniture design catalog language, stuff like that. But for this one, the letters are kind of the script and then the other, and then basically I had like different products and objects on the table. And so those in them of themselves were props where she'd maybe like make up a narrative or story around them herself. And then the letters like start out sounding kind of standard, like that one's basically verbatim, like an actual letter that she received. And as it goes on, they become more and more like sort of absurd where they almost become like love letters. Um, and then it's this game of cat and mouse and seduction maybe between my mom and this like hypothetical real estate developer. And so that became maybe the narrative like um, armature or something where reading those letters which were written by me. But then everything else in there is like improvised by her. And then usually I'll just kind of shoot and then reshoot and shoot things. And then the narrative comes together in the editing process. Like I don't usually go into the shooting with a plan exactly about what the story will be or will become. Something which is interesting, um, like in thinking about your work and how you move between uh, scales, like I think a lot of, you know, some of the juxtapositions that Flo was talking about earlier and that you've been talking about is sort of um, bringing things that appear disparate together so that we have an understanding of their likeness despite their scale relationship, right? So like the, the the relationship between this like, you know, uh, beauty magazine for Amagansett, right? Which is already in the Hamptons and the way that like, you know, the vernacular of quote unquote cleaning up neighborhoods, right? And the participation around like how things become nicer or something like this via gentrification where like these letters are an active process in mm -hmm. how like the theft gets orchestrated. Um, and then on the other hand, like the, like the kind of the darkness underneath internet how-to tutorials, which are on the one hand really helpful, but on the other hand speak to like, um, 
like the absurd lengths of like the cult of the individual that we're willing to go to in this society, right? Where you're like anything, like you can solve any problem with this like seven step like internet tutorial. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about scale. And I think on the other hand, um, maybe also like talk about um, how you think wellness culture and like major scare quotes, scare quotes around like the idea of self-care like to what extent do we need to find ways of taking care of ourselves and in what ways do these these methods like model other kinds of social relationships already in place or like mm -hmm. just how you're thinking about those ideas yeah, I guess I think like when I start to engage with things or objects or oftentimes it's first like the world within arm's reach. So like the things you can have in your hand or could have in front of a camera when you're doing a demo. Um, and that, yeah, there's kind of like, they often seem to be attempting to like create an anchor within a world that feels like fundamentally unsafe or that like, just like if you buy these 10 things, like finally, finally finally what, finally you'll be safe or finally you won't want, but always knowing that it's like not really true. Um, I mean, I think like I had, I am definitely sometimes seduced by a lot of these products and just thinking like maybe I'll hack the way to be in the world. Um, and of course, yeah, Lord talks about self-care as something that's necessary, that's radical and necessary for doing for being an agent in social change. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess like anything, these systems find a way to take a phrase and, and monetize it and turn it into something so far away from itself. Um, but I'm always kind of interested in these, in like these nuggets of language that hold like op opposing um, desires and intentions within them. Um, and just what happens when, when you kind of put shift them slightly to the left or to the right and look at them from another angle. Totally. Um, and I think also maybe the idea of comfort in your work and like how comfort can be possible because there's also like a real material and aesthetic pleasure in the objects that you make as objects like even outside of this inverted functionality like you were talking earlier about just liking working with clay or like, you know, the idea that they're the way that you make objects out of soap or something like this have this quality to them, which are pleasurable and which are intended to bring a certain kind of um, care or comfort, even if it's not the designated or intended one. Um, mm -hmm. I was wonder wondering if you could talk about, um, I don't know, like maybe comfort and aesthetics as well, if that's something that you think about. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I think about, like, maybe certain things that I find comfortable that are, like, it's very, like, that it's highly personal to me, right, that perhaps seem, I remember when my niece was little, and she first saw my video, she was like, oh, no, auntie, clean up the mess, like, clean up the mess, mommy's gonna be mad, you know, <laughs> and that it, like, that she, like, sensed something being, like, off use, and now she loves it, loves making squishy, messy things, so at least, I'm, like, Definitely, I don't know how to describe it, but like I'm very sensitive to like texture and stuff like that too, where there are certain things that I, textures that I just really love and want to be around and want to make more of and others that like upset me deeply. Like I'll start crying if I'm in front of Yayo Kusama's work for too long. It makes me so terrified. Um, or like other kinds of textures, I guess they call it like trypophobia. Oh, yeah. But like, <laughs> but like all of my food decisions are basically made based off of like mouthfeel and stuff too, before anything else. So like something's too mushy, like I find it deeply upsetting. And so I guess like with a lot of like, I feel like the best, the art that I like best is art that's like kind of generous or something or is trying to share with whoever comes upon it, whether that's providing pleasure or maybe providing like friction but like generative friction that like that the art that isn't like totally closed in on itself that has these points of entry that could be uncomfortable or could be like deeply comfortable or comforting and so yeah I think sometimes I just like like to find the things that I find really satisfying like the a lot of the 
I made these bars of soap for the last show and I like put like kind of potting soil in them and stuff like that in the glycerin soap and it's so like sparkly and wonderful but obviously like some of the stuff like keto face serum it like yeah. makes other people like deeply 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 uncomfortable um yeah. and so I guess like stuff that's in exists in both those places well I wanted to ask you about the grotesque because I feel like that's something that shows up in your work where there's this like fine line and then it's like oh she's washing her face with cheetos or something yeah yeah oh. mm -hmm. okay um, also, is there, who are the artists that you think of, like, or that you're inspired by? Um, I think, like, when, when I was younger, I really liked Linda Benglis and the pores and, like, that kind of lumpiness. And I love, um, Laura Provost videos and switching raspberries and stuff like that. And I think, I don't know, I feel like also a lot of, I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of femme artists like grotesque things too. Maybe yeah. it's something about being in a body that's uh, that framed as seductive and uh, and dangerous or something and messy always at all times with like messy parts meant to be hidden and other ones meant to be revealed. That draws me to a lot of artists' work. Um, so right now we're- Oh, sorry, go ahead. oh wait, Kelly, go. go, go. Oh no, I was just saying, it's interesting also with these things though in the grotesque, you use such like soft, approachable colors within it all as well. Like, so it doesn't, in first glance, it doesn't feel at all grotesque because it looks so soft, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and these are images from your show, right? From Hesse Flatlow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to paint the back wall, that pink, that kind of glossy a pink. And at first I was looking around for how I would display things. And so I was going into different kind of wellness stores and makeup stores. And um, I went to that Glossier store that's like near China, near Canal Street. And have you been to this store before? No, it's like a walk is always like a mile long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. I went the one time I went like, for some reason, I think maybe it had just opened and, or like had soft opened so that it wasn't crowded. But like you walk up this like carpeted tunnel stairwell that looks like you're walking up a vaginal canal. Like it's pink all around, mushy pink, and then like red, like up the carpet. And then, and then you get to the top and in the store, they're all like all the salespeople are in pink and they're lots of like, they're like rose quartz, mushy pink chairs. and. Um, there are all these anthurium, like kind of vaginal looking flowers everywhere. And yeah, I don't know why they want to feel like you're, I mean, I guess like with a goop, sh like when that goop show happened on Netflix, Gwyneth Paltrow had, yeah. she's in that big like vulva roses or something like that. Um, it's like an extra hyper feminine space. Um, mm -hmm. How, is there a time limit when because of the line? I was wondering, or like, how does it work? So I have no idea because I don't know why when I went there it was like not empty. I don't know what what is happening in the time I went. But yeah, every time I've walked by since there's I've always seen the long line, so I don't know. Yeah. But it's really kind of silly because it's like there's hardly anything. Like you, yeah. There's just like nothing to see there. I don't know besides like the so interesting architecture. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think this, like, trend of, like, you know, there's all these, like, kind of colors that are also, like, baby colors mm -hmm. that are really trendy? Do you think it's gonna end? <laughs> because I feel like it's gonna, it's been happening for a long time, right? Yeah, I remember reading something about how, like, it was some, like, design, or I was listening to a design podcast that was talking about how we're in, like, a kind of a low, a, like, bad era of graphic design or something because of, like, how uniform everything has become with the sans serif things and like with the prevailing theme of all these companies wanting you to think they're your friend or something mm -hmm. and you're all like but and all the like fonts try to look friendly and the like um yeah everything looks inviting and curved or something um i was gonna ask you it's something that you were talking about a little bit earlier but um one 
really important strategy for your earlier work, and I think it's a still an important strategy um, that you're using in the newer work, is this idea of inverting functionality or displacing functionality, um, making ceramic tools that might break or tools made out of soap um, or like casting beauty products and making soaps out of them, which um, I think for the first time, maybe dumbly, I was sort of remembering just the like novelty soaps as tourist items, you know, as well, like when you might go to like a place and buy a soap that looks like a parrot or something because you just went on a cruise. Um, which I think is also sort of interesting, like the, the tourist economy of wellness in a way. Um, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about um, like it, it, about form and function and really how you're thinking through form and why inverting functionality is so important or displacing this is so important to you. Yeah, I think like when I uh, first started thinking about the video I made called Reparation Hardware. I had been at the Museum of Arts and Design and that was where I kind of, cause I had been like, my friends had showed me how to like put stuff in the kiln and stuff in grad school, but I never have taken a ceramics class or anything like that or had any training. So like when I was at that museum, that was kind of like doing the residency. It's this residency where the wall to your studio is glass and like you have to be there for fixed for a fixed 40 hours a week and their hours are posted, and there are certain hours where you have to be open to the public coming in. And so you're almost like an um, installation of an artist in their natural habitat or something like this. And so that was kind of where I like sort of learned a lot of things because there are all these enthusiasts who come to the museum and they'd walk in and give me a tidbit of information here and a bit there, or like, why are you making these look bad on purpose? <laughs> and then, so I got interested when I was there in this idea of like, the ceramic hammer and I was thinking about it like this tool that would like undo itself through its very use and I was wondering like if like the American project or something like that might be a ceramic hammer in and of itself but it had been feeling like that I mean obviously it feels like that every day we feel that but yeah I had been particularly I was thinking about it in relationship to nostalgia because I had just been, come to the residency from I was living in Virginia I was living in Richmond and you know, during the election and all that. And so it felt like I was in this giant Confederate monument of a city that definitely felt like I had never imagined that the monuments would come down there. It didn't feel that possible at all to me. And when I made the video called Reparation Hardware, it was this idea of like, there's this designer who's pitching a high-end furniture line, but that line is in fact reparations for African-Americans. <laughs> and like, when I made it, it seemed more, you know, like there weren't any presidential candidates like talking about it as a real possibility or anything like that and so yeah so I was thinking about this tool as like kind of holding within it this sort of intrinsic failure like the, the tool in of itself is like a question mark of how you're supposed to approach it and how to touch it and um, thinking about like reparations as maybe being so scary for so many people because they mark the past like if we like if we like old furniture and stuff, antiques, maybe it's because it says the past is a success, right? And you can bring it into your own tastefully. But that reparations would mark the past as a failure and not only as a failure, but a failure in like economic terms specifically. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of those ideas kind of came from this ceramic hammer. Yeah. That's somehow. also like, that feels also like a really witty gloss on Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. um, but like the different essay, the master's tool essay, right? Yeah, yeah um, that one. Yeah. And I was thinking about that, like, yeah, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. But also the conversation she had with James Baldwin, where yeah. she says, like, for me, the American dream was, um, it was it was always a nightmare, basically, she says, it was never a dream. That's right. Um, Gabby, should we... Do we have any questions? We have one question from um, VLM. Um, and <laughs> if anybody else has questions they want um, to ask Ilana, send them over to me and I'll pose them. But so Virginia wants to know about um, how script writing influences your video artwork. Um, 
another question relating to improvisation, but also whether the lines that are delivered, uh, whether they're rehearsed in general. And do you have, do you work from scripts? Um, no, I will take like little bits and pieces like sentences from lots of different sources. So, you know, like, uh, like the Sherman's notes, field orders, which were like the, the Union general who first mentioned that idea of 40 acres and a mule. So like text he wrote, and then obviously things Audre Lorde said, and then things catalogs today said, and I'll just kind of have it, maybe like have the writing in front of me, like out of view of the camera. And like, I'll just test saying things out and seeing how they feel in my mouth and saying them again in front of the camera. And then if they work, like, um, but like one thing's off or something, like there's a weird sound in the background, then maybe I'll go back and reshoot it again. And then in context of like videos that have like voiceover, sometimes I'll record all of these things first and then kind of pace them around and see if there's an order that makes sense. And then I'll go back into the studio and record it well in, a, in something that looks almost like a script. But it's after first kind of taking each little fragment of language like on its own. Um, and I also wanted to know, um, I credit you actually for introducing me to the Breadface blog mm -hmm. um, Instagram channel. Um, and I was wondering if you have like recommendations for um, wellness series that we should be following and or general like recommendations for stuff that inspires you right now. Hmm. What else am I looking at? I think I'll have to come back to you with some bricks or something because okay. lately <laughs> these days I've just been looking at lots of like docs and Instagram accounts like just <laughs> dot like docs and being cute and stuff but I don't know. <laughs> so it has a lot to do with comfort and maybe not like content. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's sort of, um, that's sort of one of the lines I think that's so clear in your work too, which is that like, even if um, all of these things about wellness culture, um, which are more tenuous or critical, like there are a lot of things out there that do in fact make us feel good you know, like, it's not so easy to separate pleasure out from the equation, just because it's implicated in all of these other systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like those algorithms are tricky, though, because like, <laughs> I had had it in my idea that I wanted to buy like, some jewelry that I would just like earrings that I would wear that were made mostly of gold. So it would like irritate me or something. And yeah. so I didn't know, I was looking at lots of different brands and I didn't like the ones that are kind of low, like cost less, but are still made out of a material and nothing really worked. And then I got this ad on Instagram that was a dachshund wearing golden jewelry. And I was like, what's this company? And of course that's where I bought, where I bought the product from, so. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so what is that company? <laughs> oh my god it really is called? it's called like atomic gold or something like a u t uh -huh. oh yeah but yeah they're yeah i don't know yeah so if you're gonna buy from somewhere they seem like they're, nice they're enough cool yeah yeah they don't like photoshop their pictures of people so yeah. that's nice um, well, I, since I know you have to head out early, I think maybe we should end a little bit early and give folks a couple of minutes to like casually chime in and ask, you know, talk to you if they want to before you have to head out. So, um, Sounds good. great. So everyone, I'm going to just force unmute everybody. Um, and then if you want to mute yourself, do that. Um, but thank you so much again, Alana. It's so great to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank for inviting you. me. This was really fun. Yay. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Some familiar faces. Yeah. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> this is a really interesting conversation. It was really nice. I've never heard you speak, so I'm really glad I got to. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I hadn't really gotten to talk about the newer piece yet with folks, so. Glad got to talk it through with you all a bit.
Wow, your cat is so cute. <laughs> well, that cat is enjoying so much. <laughs> uh, this is one of that cat. And he likes your work. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> um, and Virginia and Alana, you were at a residency together, like mm -hmm. around this time last year, right? Was yeah. that in yeah. Gansett? Yeah, that's where I started. I was snooping around all of the cult, like wellness exercise things and stuff <laughs> like that. We went to like a yoga class or something, right? Yeah, Alana's good at yoga, and I'm not. <laughs> well, we went on the discount day, so it was a little different from their, like, normal vibe or something. But the discount day is still, like, like, exp like not that cheap or something, but. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was wild to be out there. I mean, I, I, I'm a born and raised Houstonian from Texas, so the whole Hampton scene and environment is so culturally different from what I grew up in and yeah definitely to see all the perfect white picketed houses and like the the goop Gwyneth Paltrow stuff it's it's really it's really cool I can't believe you went to the cats on the move all those different classes Alana I mean I was worried that you were gonna get uh you know kidnapped by one of the cults <laughs> <laughs> there's this one called the class that I recommend if you're gonna look up something weird I'm Line with that up. <laughs> it's called the class. And class. If, if you, uh, they kind of hide a lot of their identity from their like web presence because it's so weird once you're actually there. <laughs> um, but it's also recommended by Gwyneth Paltrow. And it's like, I remember the first time I went, it was the discounted day, which still cost like forty dollars, and it was like to raise money for children in Nicaragua to do yoga or something. Was like what the fundraising was, but. When you get there, it's just calisthenics and like screaming and like pastel, like uh, athleisure. Yeah. That's really funny. And the, the, the people that go there go like there every day, like they're super fans. Yeah, I wonder. I bet I like, I feel like my body couldn't be capable of doing that, but I went there and I went there on a day that they called a wild rose brunch. So it was like, you could go and a woman from after you did the class like a woman from Oleda would be doing a demo of the beauty products and she would say like oh this is made from like these rose petals and the rose petals are grown in this community in Romania where you know they didn't even have paved roads before they started working with Oleda and we give them picture books because they can't read to tell them when to pick the roses and we have Pro we have projects like this around the globe, like providing opportunity to like different <laughs> communities. And then she's like, ladies, okay, like how do we touch our faces? And someone's like, woo, woo. And then she, they're like, and she's like, yes, it's very, the skin around the eyes is very delicate. And, um, and like, they're definitely like kind of very racist acting, like the salespeople were ignoring me. And like, they also had, they were giving out these bouquets of, um, like local Hampton flowers or something you could have too and like um, an alcoholic rosé or something oh lord oh we should God. have been making picture books for the flower growers in the Hamptons oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the product's like $200 a pop <laughs> I always thought those were funny about the tutorials that they do like these celebrities where they like go through these 20 routines and then you know, you're like you look something up and they're all at least like $200 and then they're like and then we put this solar thing on our face to that you're like oh my god like who has time to do with this routine <laughs> yeah I think they have this lady like from moon juice which is some like oh kind yeah, of yeah health food thing and like she went through her daily meal routine and it, like someone added it up and it was like two thousand dollars or something for all Whoa. those weird niche oh. products but i remember i wanted i got really hungry and i went into this place next to that yoga place and it's like a coffee shop and they had these dried mango that were from moon juice and i was like okay i'll just buy it they don't have price tags on anything <laughs> and the and it was like three slivers of dried mango uh, just dried mango and it was like $16 or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. It was cool. And have something special <laughs> in it? Like, like no, I, powder? Like. Yeah, I read the ingredients. So it was like a little squeeze of lime juice and some chili powder and mango. And that's it. Wow. It's in gold. <laughs> 
Um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, does anyone have any other questions? Everybody says no. I hope everyone's okay. Good to see everybody. We and made it to August. Yeah. Yes. And when Woo! is our next chat? Our uh, next chat. Next chat is the sixteenth, I believe. We're no, no, nineteenth. Oh, nineteenth. Sorry, yeah. we're taking next week off and maybe transitioning to a two week slash more irregular schedule. Like every um, other week, yeah. Yeah, and it's gonna be Shanice. Um, Greenberg? Greenberg. Yeah. Um, so um, if you're free and you want to come. Please you know. join us. Yeah. And thank so. you again, Alana. And it's really thank good you. to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Have everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Hey.